So now I shall introduce our speaker for this evening, Jennifer Anielski from the Mariners Museum Library and Archives. She'll talk about discovering the story of immigration. She's going to introduce us to the Mariners Museum Library and Archives and show us how to utilize the materials available. Additionally, she will share with us research techniques and discuss a wide variety of resources to help us discover our immigrant ancestors. Jennifer is the library tech Librarian Technical Services at the Mariners Museum and Park in Newport News, Virginia. With over 20 years of service at the Mariners, Jennifer assists library guests in utilizing the co collection to try and locate information on their ancestors or the vessels they came over on. So with that, I will stop sharing and welcome Jennifer. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, that should be up. Perfect. So, yep, so I'm seeing head nods for those that they can see, so that's good. It's always difficult when you can't see both. So let me go ahead and flip through this. So as I was introduced, my name is Jennifer. I am uh, the librarian at the Mariners Museum and Park. Um, I have been there for almost 22 years, actually. I've uh, been through quite a bit there, started out as a library assistant, um, and one of my greatest passions working there is working with people, helping them connect to their ancestors and the vessels they came in on. So I'm going to start with a quick overview of what we have, because a lot of people don't know what we have. Um, we have, uh, I myself am responsible for approximately 110,000 volumes of books, journals, and pamphlets. Uh, those date from 1502 to present day. We have approximately 950,000 photographs and images, uh, all of which we are happy to pull out and show you or digitize and show you. Uh, Two million manuscript items. Those range from uh, letters from the Civil War, uh, people that uh, we actually have a diary of a young woman who was on a steamship. We have diaries from whaling captains, uh, we have 5,000 maps. You can see the numbers, so I'm not gonna keep reading them to you, but we do have quite a bit that we can offer to you. So I do wanna start out with giving you that fair warning. I am not a trained genealogist. I'm by no means an expert. Um, I am happy to help in any way, shape or form. Um, having helped people in 22 years, I have learned a few tricks along the way. Um, most people that contact us, um, they wanna know if we have any information on their ancestors. We don't have a lot of information on the individuals themselves. What we do have access to is potentially images of the vessels they came in on. Depending upon when they came, they may appear in a few of the passenger ships we have. Um, those passenger ship lists, we only have about 300 or so. We also have uh, log books from ships. Most of those are military based, so there aren't a whole lot of immigrants in them, but every once in a while we find someone's ancestor. Uh, short side story on that. My favorite one, um, we actually have a log book from a uh, British vessel. And the woman uh, that had contacted us knew um, that her relative had served on it. Oh, he was mentioned. Uh, what was mentioned was his court martial. So a little bit of fun story that uh, she learned about her ancestor. We didn't know there was a connection, but it's all from us going through transcribing the material and getting that information for them. So kind of want to go through some of the things that we have discovered that help us and we will help you figure out as much of this as possible. For your ancestors, we ask that people know their full original name. We know what happened when people came over. Names got anglicized, names got shortened, names got totally changed, spellings went all over the place. Uh, as you can see from my last name, it's a little hard to figure out. Um, it is Polish. Um, it is from my husband. Uh, technically, it's incorrect. I should have an A at the end of it. My maiden name is Kirch. It's been spelled four different ways from what we can see uh, going through our history. So we know it's difficult. We always tell people, be creative with how you're looking for it. Try every possible 
even things that you're like, there's no way that I could be an E. You'd be surprised what you can find out. Uh, we also prefer dates. If you know about how old your ancestor was, when they arrived, when they left could even help because depending upon when they left can give us an idea of when they arrived. Um, we've seen passenger uh, travel go anywhere from two months to 4.5 days on a steamship in the largest uh, age of travel that we look at. If you know what nationality they were, that's great. If you know where they left from, that helps even better. If you know where they arrived, that's great too, but sometimes the original port of arrival is not where they actually wound up getting off. Um, I have relatives that were supposed to get off in New York. We found them in lists coming into Boston. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what you got to do. You just got to look everywhere, and that's what we will help you with. Um, another good spot to look at for names, um, oral traditions. If you've got family histories, family Bibles, take a look at that. Church records, uh, published genealogies, uh, local histories help too. Passports, if you're looking for anything between 1791 and 1925, National Archives is the spot to check out for that. Um, that's partially because of the Homestead Act of 1862. And then um, they also have the citizenship and naturalization records that will help. Um, most of this is now on Ancestry, so if you have access, that's great. So I had mentioned passenger lists. Uh, we have, like I said, about 300 of them. Ours are primarily for first and saloon, and then we have some second class. They mainly covered the late 19th to the early 20th centuries. We have very few from steerage passengers in our collection. And our lists actually vary from handwritten all the way up to the printed booklets. Um, and this is a good example that you're seeing on your screen. This is a Cunard one uh, for a second uh, class. About 95 to 98% of immigrants actually traveled by steerage. So you are more than likely to find those passenger lists at the National Archives through Ellis Island, Ellis Island or online in some of the um, online archives that are popping up. Um, if you're not familiar with ISTG, they are a wonderful transcription guild that has been um, transcribing all the passenger lists they can get their hands on. And if you just Google ISTG, you, it should pop up for you. Um, there's a couple important things to know that prior to 1820, there was no law requiring the recording of passenger arrivals in US ports. Um, immigration records were handled by the colonies, states, and port cities, and they varied by area and by custom house. So if you know what it's like in Virginia, it, can, it is totally different in Maryland. Um, I can speak for Virginia because I've done a lot of research that way. Uh, they have some, but unfortunately some of those records did burn as well. Um, if a passenger list does exist, it's more than likely going to be in a local archival collection uh, local port records, newspapers, local histories, courthouses, custom house records um, sometimes exist in museums. Sometimes you will find copies at the state archives. It really depends. Um, search everywhere. If you're looking for somewhere, start. I highly suggest starting with uh, state archives. Nine times out of ten, they're going to be able to help direct you with where someone else might have a copy. A lot of the list and index are being published and are on the web now. So it has really, really changed the way we're able to search. Uh, this is a book you may or may not be familiar with. Um, we lovingly refer to it as Philby's because of the editor. Um, basically, it is a wonderful index of indexes. It's a passenger and immigration list index. They put them out quite often. This is just a scan of the first edition. Uh, they go all throughout. And all it is is a list of names and it's a cumulative index that identifies all the passenger lists that they, all the passengers they have ever found in various spots they look. And I'll go through some of those with you. But it identifies not just the name, but the age, their US destination, the year of immigration, 
Um, and then it gives you a citation number and a page number. That citation number tells you where that record actually is from, whether it's the uh, passenger arrivals at the port of New York from 1830 to 1832, which is a National Archives microfilm, uh, the book Irish Immigrants in North America, English Origins of American Colonists, uh, the wonderful book German Immigrants, Lists of Passengers Bound from Bremen to New York. So instead of having to flip through about 15 different books, this is one-stop shopping. Librarians love to make life easier for people. We love to help you, but we want you to be able to find your information quickly. So when you're looking for information about ships and you're contacting us, this is what we're gonna ask you for. We're gonna ask you for the name of the vessel, when it arrived, where it arrived, if you know what type it is, the date it was built, who the captain was, when it left and where it left from. A lot of this sounds like, oh, well that's easy to find. No. So first trick, names of the vessel. A lot of vessels had the same name and were sailing at the same time. That's where date of arrival or date of departure really helps. Um, the type of vessel and the captain can really help us narrow it down. Um, I can just give you one example um, and we're actually gonna see it in a couple of slides. There's two brothers sailing at the same time. Yes, the vessel's name was Brother. Uh, it makes it all the more fun. Um, in one of the registers I have, I have a page and a half of a vessel named Mary. So if you know that your ancestors arrived on the Mary in say 1860, well, I have about 70 vessels at that time that were sailing. That's where if we know where it was going, where it was coming from, we can use our other sources to help really narrow that down. So the more information you have, the better. We will do everything we can to help you figure everything out though. So there's also different types of immigrant ships depending upon when you're going. So I've got the dates on there as examples and there is some overlap. So you did have sailing vessels the same time you had steamships. And then, you know, these days we've got steamships, we've got airplanes. Um, so I'm mainly focusing on the ship portion and looking more at the earlier to make it a little more easier for us. So just a little tidbit of information for you though. Uh, Fulton developed the steamship in 1807, but it wasn't until the 1840s that they really began to install those steamships or those onto steamships but they also kept them with sails. And the steamship sometimes was the auxiliary and the sails were the main. Makes it a little interesting when you're trying to track vessels and you're like, oh, it's a steamship. It'll go across pretty quickly. Some of those were still taking over a month to travel. And we actually had side wheel steamers um, with sails traveling. So if you picture kind of what was on the Mississippi River, what's still on the Mississippi River, uh, try picturing one of those traveling across the ocean. Um, they did it, we have proof, uh, but it's still just a little difficult to think about. The other thing is when we talk about sailing ships, it gets very confusing for people because there are all different types of sailing ships. They're not just sailing ships. There are schooners, brigantines, brigs, barks. Um, and even within these classes, there are subclasses. All of this means is how many masts and how many sails and how they were all rigged. I'm not an expert. I still have to look it up. I've been doing this for 20 some years and I still have to look it up. But the hint is when you're reading some of the information about the vessels and you see it talk about it, say the Bark Maria or the Snow Anna or the Brig Calcutta. Well, those first words, Bark, Snow and Brig, those are all different types of vessels. So they're not actually part of the name. So it's the names are actually Maria, Anna, and Calcutta. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, that also helps us when we're helping you research the vessel, or if you come in and do the research yourself, um, you know what section of a register to look at to figure it out. So the most common types that you do see are barks and ships. Um, we do see a lot of brigs, um, but they tend to be uh, fairly specific areas that they're going into. 
Um, the short answer is ships and barks have three masts, um, the front, the middle, and the back. Um, and most of them do have the triangular sails. So we're gonna go on to the next screen. So here's a couple examples just to get an idea of what they look like. Um, and this is gonna take you all the way back to the mid to late 16th century. So we have images for you, even if your relatives came back way back then. So this is a Theodore de Bry illustration um, and it dates to 1599. So this is actually an example of a rounded hole with three masts. So it's actually called a round ship. We're not super creative when it comes to naming vessels. Um, we have a lot of different examples. Obviously there's no photographs during that time period. I joke about this because we do get asked about once a month for someone looking for photographs from the 15 and 1600s. <laughs> I love the laughter. <laughs> Uh, we're going to go a little bit further ahead. So this is an 1840s vessel. This is also a slave ship. It's called the Le Antonio. It is a hermaphrodite brig. All that means is its rigging is a little funny, uh, but it is brig rigged. Uh, this is basically 1840s, like I said. Uh, it's a great example because from 1571 to about 1870, about 23 million slaves were imported to the Americas. About 4% were actually imported to British North America. Um, the ships used in the slave trade were often brigs, brigantines, and schooners because they were primarily designed for speed. This is what those vessels look like. We're going to go about nine years ahead. So this is 1849. This is a bark. It's the Ann and Mary. You'll notice the three masts, uh, the four in main, the square rigs. Um, from set the 1770s to the 1840s, all the vessels were sail, and most of them were also referred to as packet ships, which meant they had a regular fixed route. Yay, easy to figure out where they started and where they stopped and how often they ran. But in 1803, there was a passenger vessel act that limited uh, the number of people it could carry. Notice I said 1803. So it wasn't until then that they started limiting everything and it was one passenger per two tons of ship. You can still pack a lot of people on ship. Trips about that in that time took about two months. So we'll go up a little bit further, 1855. This is one of my favorite time periods because you have both sail and steam. And most of us are used to seeing, you know, the steamships with the big, huge funnels. Yeah, this guy's got that teeny tiny little one in the middle. The sails are the primary. Uh, this is the Teutonia. It was built in 1855. Um, so basically 1840s, Cunard started building some of the first steam sail ships. Uh, the Britannia of theirs crossed in about 14 days. So we went directly from about two months to 14 days. Great shortening of time period. By the 1850s, steamships were making regular crossings and most were only taking the two weeks to go across. So this one may or may not be familiar to a lot of you. This is the Queen Mary. Uh, she was built in 1936. Uh, this photo is actually from June 1st when she was sitting in quarantine in uh, New York Harbor and all those vessels surrounding her are harbor vessels. So even when vessels came in, even all the way up into the 1930s, they were still having to sit in quarantine. What that means is as we're tracking vessels in newspapers, we can't just go, oh, well, I know they arrived on this day. Okay. But did that mean they debarked that day? Or does that mean that's when the vessel actually hit US waters? Uh, did they have to sit in quarantine for a time period? That forces us to look backwards and forwards a couple of days just to figure out the exact date. Um, and newspapers were, even at this time, not always the best at getting it exactly right on the day. Uh, just an FYI, Queen Mary's trip took 4.5 days. 
I'm going to go all the way up to present day. Now, this one, unfortunately, I have no records on as far as the immigration, um, but this is an example. So this is a vessel that was built in 2004. It was built up in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Folklife Festival. It is a Haitian fishing boat. It is only 15 feet long. Um, this is the typical vessel that people fleeing Haiti would load up and uh, try to escape to the United States. 15 feet long, it's probably not even two feet wide, and they packed this with people. Um, I just like to bring this so that it takes people all the way up to present day about immigration. There's no records for these people. I mean, when the Coast Guard catches them, if the Coast Guard catches them, they do have to do the paperwork there. But to imagine this boat loaded up with say 30 people trying to cross from Haiti to the United States, there's not a lot of room. People are packed on top of each other, um, but it's a perfect life story example of what people are willing to do even today to come to America. So let's go into some resources. So here's some that we have, and I know this is very Virginia focused. Um, luckily, some of this stuff does cover um, outside of Virginia, and there are examples for other states as well. Um, so if you're dealing with 1607 to 1789, uh, the Virginia Historical Index, which is also known as the SWIM Index, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it should become your best friend if you're doing any genealogy from that time period, not just travel. Uh, it indexes all the major early Virginia publications in one central spot, so you can look up your relative, and it tells you everywhere they're mentioned. One-stop shopping. Love it. Uh, the Virginia Gazetteer or excuse me, the Virginia Gazette, which was a newspaper, has great articles on ships, and it actually has an index. Um, the Naval Office Shipping List was actually kept by the British. It was there maintaining the offices of each major port they had. I have a list of all of the ports that we have on microfilm. Um, love microfilm. So those list uh, the vessel name, the date built, the place built, the owner of the vessel, where it was coming from, and most of the time it does list the cargo or the people as well. Um, the slave trade statistics does list the names of the vessels, but it does not list any names. Um, I hate that it doesn't. Uh, we actually have a couple other sources that we are trying to work on that actually do start to list um, names when they have them. The Sailing Navy list is actually a British, um, and it is British Navy built, purchased, or captured vessels from 1688 to 1860. Um, it's great because it's got a glossary and plans of the descriptions of their vessels. So if you know a relative, say, was serving in the British military, British Navy, and uh, came over, uh, you've got a good example of that way. So we're going to jump ahead a couple years, 1741s. Um, Lloyd's List, a wonderful resource. It basically tracks all ship movements, not just in Britain. Um, it's all around the world. Um, the problem with this is there is no index and it is tedious to search because it is definitely the print from the 1740s. It's beautiful, but it is hard to read on microfilm. Um, if you're going to be going through that, just make sure you allot yourself a lot of time to go through it. Um, Lloyd's Register and the dates listed here are the issues that we have at the Mariner's Museum. Um, so the register is nothing more than a list of vessels um, and it's indexed by name. Um, but it tells you about those vessels. So there's ratings. So A is approved for transatlantic travel. E, it can carry dry cargo, transatlantic. I, can't carry dry cargo. And they even have a rating that is O, which is not deemed safe for any foreign voyage. It's amazing the number of those that are in there that actually were making foreign trips. People were willing to risk their lives to come. 
let's see, the Liverpool ship registers, uh, registers from Liverpool uh, with the foreign vessels uh, that were visiting the port. Those are listed by date. Uh, slave ship movements by Joan Charles. That I do have digitally. So if anybody would ever want to see a copy of that and can't make it to the museum, you just email us and our emails at the end. Um, we'd be happy to share a copy with you. Um, the American and Commercial Daily Advertiser is out of Baltimore and it lists all the ship movements and arrivals in that area. Going a little further in time, closer in time, depending upon how you look at it, New York Herald was actually an important first source um, for verifying specific vessels. And that's because it links the name of the vessel, the type of ship, and it often lists the captain's name. So that's where we can actually look at it and go, okay, if your relative came into New York around that time period, that's where we can go to make it all match. The other thing with that one is it goes back to what I was talking about with the, you know, a day before or a day after doesn't always mention it on the exact day it arrived. It'll report that it arrived, but it maybe arrived the day before. Um, sometimes they'll mention uh, things in there like, oh, this ship arrived and it mentioned passing this other vessel. Well, you've got that lull in there as for time period as well. Um, the maritime intelligence section of that lists the arrivals and departures for New York City and ports around the world. Um, it's got the name, captain, the home port, and selected events that occurred during the voyage. The New York Maritime Register is a list of ships entering that port by date. Okay, we're almost done, I promise. Um, at least for going through all this, lots and lots of information. Um, I will allow my slides to be shared at the end. So if there, I know they'll have a link that we can, I can just paste the link in for you. So I will make that happen. Uh, for immigration resources, 1857 to present day, record of American and foreign shipping. Um, that's just the American version of Lloyd's Register because every country has their own register of vessels. So this just happens to be the uh, what exists here in the United States. Uh, it is currently known as ABS, the American Bureau of Shipping, and it is all digital. Unfortunately, it only covers what is current. If you are looking for vessels that sailed in the past, you have to go to the paper copies. But a lot of those are on happy trust, at least up until copyright. Uh, Lloyd's Register, same thing. It's just the British version. Um, I do want to point out that for those of you that are local or want to contact us, we have the largest collection of ship registers in North America. So if you're doing vessel research, you probably want to ask us. We're happy to help. Um, we can take a look at those for you, send you scans, no problem. Uh, if you're local, believe it or not, the uh, Norfolk Virginian pilot actually did vessel arrivals. I think they still do. Um, we can make copies of all of that. There is a bibliography that we are working on updating, which is why I didn't include it and didn't have it as a handout. Uh, we are adding all of the new sources we have for it. So if that is something that you're interested in, we can definitely get that out to you guys as well. Once it's updated, I'm hoping in the next month. So I was talking about the registers. This is an example of the American Lloyd's Register, which is the same as the American registers. There were three companies uh, fighting for control as to who would be the American version of Lloyd's. Um, so this is just one of those years. So this happens to be a page um, for Barks. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if not, uh, if you look at the bottom two records, they are both for the California. Uh, and those are both within three tons of each other and they were built a year apart. So if you know your relative came over on the California, we're gonna have fun trying to figure out who or which one. But the captain, if you know the captain, we can use that to help determine exactly which California it was. All right. 
So here's the types of information that we can provide for you. Images, uh, photographs, if you're interested, really interested in ships and you want to know about design characteristics, plans, logbooks. If it's a merchant vessel, we don't have a lot, but we can have, we have some. Um, if your relatives came over uh, during the golden age, we do have quite a bit regarding steamship lines and the vessels themselves. And I've actually got some examples of all of this. So here is a photo. This is an 1884 vessel. This is the Etruria. Um, and this vessel, according to the Morton Allen Directory of European and Passenger Steamship Arrivals, uh, traveled from Liverpool to New York in 1894. So if you know, you read that information and you want to see the vessel, we actually do have the photos for you. One of the things we actually get asked quite a bit is, how much did it cost? So this one I actually have to read. So in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was the exception and not the rule when the immigrant paid for his own passage. The immigrants were either imported or made contracts with the captains of the vessels who, when they arrived, sold them privately by public auction into temporary servitude. Adults were sold for a term of three to six years and children for 10 to 15 years. The servants signed indentures and were known as indentured servants. The last sale of this kind took place in Philadelphia uh, either in 1818 or 1819. And then the cost of transporting servants to Virginia from England during the 17th century was about six pounds. That source, just so you know, is um, the Lower Norfolk County, Virginia Antiquary by Edward James, published in 1951. So we're gonna go up a couple years. In 1823, there was a general public outcry from agents and ship owners and it was accompanied by an increase from two pounds to five pounds in the cost of passage. So what actually is on your screen is uh, from the Allen line from 1877 and 78, uh, and it's 75 to $160 for adults. If you're payable in, paying in gold and traveling first class, if you're going to steerage, it's gonna be 20 to $32 payable in currency. There is a difference. So this is an example of what a ticket looks like. Um, this ticket was purchased by a Mary Connell for her and her seven children traveling from Queenstown, Ireland to Boston in 1881 on the steamship Sarmation. And its name is somewhere in this list. Um, so steerage passengers, they have to provide their own plate, mug, knife, fork, spoon, water cup, all of their bedding, and all of this, which couldn't be purchased at Liverpool or the dairy for six to seven shillings. Um, by the way, each passenger was only allowed 10 cubic feet of luggage, which was free on the steamer. But if you were getting there and then taking the rail, it was another 112 pounds. The certificates had to be used within a year of purchase. Um, now this one in particular, she was actually, her final destination was Boston. So there is no rail charge for it. But if you notice, um, when you look at it, you've got the names of the passengers, their ages at the time, and then her sum paid. So here's an example of a brochure. Um, we're going a little more modern. This is a 1911 brochure. It does still identify the steerage rates um, and the proposed sailings um, and the ship names that they were sailing during that time. The fare information is written in both German and in English. Um, this being a North German Lloyd, that makes sense. Um, the cost was about $40 for the express steamer and $35 for the regular steamer. Steamer. So on the back of the brochure is the immigration law that was done in February of 1907, which prohibits the following types of people from entering the United States. 
and I'm reading this. Idiots, imbeciles, feeble-minded, epileptics, insane, paupers, beggars, those with tuberculosis, those with contagious diseases, criminals, polygamists, anarchists, prostitutes, children under 16 if unaccompanied by one of both parents. Oh, and by the way, the baggage was 15 cubic feet on the ship, which is at about 150 pounds on American railroads. But I just, for this particular brochure, the 1911, I love the fact that they list the, here's all the people we're not going to allow, including the children under 16, which is still actually relevant today. So this is an example of a third class cabin. So this image is from, I actually don't have that noted. Uh, that's about the 19 teens as well. Um, so this is actually from a brochure. So this is what they were advertising for their third class. You'll notice there's the bunks, the water in between and a few hooks. That's all you got. Uh, I wanna follow up on some more of the rules that were done during that time. So the Passenger Vessel Act of 1803 in England did limit, it, did limit the number of passengers to one to every two tons on the ship's register. But there was no criteria on the vessel's total passenger list. So the way they got around that and packed more people on board was hmm, children. So those under 14 were considered to be half an adult. Those under seven were only a third of an adult and infants one year and older or one year and younger, they didn't count at all. So you could really start packing some people on board. We all know that will cause some problems. Um, in 1817, uh, people were starting to complain and conditions became so bad that the government stepped in in 1823. So it went from one side all the way to the other, and the laws went ahead and just restricted it passengers to one to every five tons. Ships also became required to carry better provisions, enough for all passengers, and they had to be submit all had to submit for inspection um, to prove that they were providing what they were required to do so. It actually was a select committee of the House of Commons that investigated. Um, and the result of the act, because it was found that so many people were trying to evade this law. So that one. here's an example of a sailing schedule. Oops, one page too many for me. So steamship lines went through all different sorts of methods to try and market their potential uh, to potential immigrants from Europe. So this is one from 1926. Uh, it was created by the Scandinavian American line. Um, and in the coloring with the maps, um, it was designed for those specifically in that area to come to America. This is one of my favorites for direct marketing campaigns. This is the Hamburg America line to get people to come to Canada. Specifically, they were hoping farmers would come you typically don't see fields of wheat and a steamship together. Um, this is actually off of a poster that we have as well. Um, they were so pushing for farmers that they did brochures, sorry, posters. Um, we actually have a painting, a massive painting, um, not necessarily for immigration, but it was definitely for travel of a vessel going to um, Egypt. And it actually is one of their boats sitting in front of the pyramids. And they actually commissioned a painting to do that. So this also is a great hint that if you can't find your ancestor coming in through American ports, check the Canadian records as well. So here's a link to where to search us, uh, link for our catalog, our email, which is super simple, library at marinersmuseum.org. Uh, we are happy to have people visit us. I would suggest making an appointment first because our stacks are closed, which means we pull all that information out for you. But if you can't make it to come visit us, 
if you email us, we are happy to work with you and do as much of the research as we can, and we will scan the material and send it to you. Sometimes there's a fee, but not always. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and I can turn that back over and if we want to open it up for questions somehow. I am happy to take questions. All right. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions. Let me get my windows all in the right place here. I'm grabbing paper and pen. Oh. And yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, yes, please, on the offer to send the updated bi bibliography when you have it ready. Um, you, you, you said you can send it if, if we want. Yes, we want. And we can put it, uh, we can put a link to it on our website and distribute it however we can. Um, for questions, you mentioned passports and you said they were $17.95 to, and she didn't catch the end date. So how recent are the, uh, how, how recent do they go? $17.91 to 1925. Okay. And that's for the National Archives. Are there indexes or any way to find information on American citizens who traveled to Europe on vacation in the early, early 20th century? I'd be interested in finding a passenger list to show who they traveled with. Yes. And if you have access to Ancestry, they're actually putting a lot more of that online. But all sh uh, for that time period, those ships were required to list their passenger lists. And that's another one through if they left from an American port, National Archives, if you know where they were going, you can also check um, with that country's equivalent and they may have it as well. Okay. Not sure if this question applies to the Manners Museum, but where should I search for documentation of an ancestor working in Virginia shipyards, specifically Portsmouth during World War II? working in the Portsmouth shipyard. So the Norfolk Naval shipyard that was in Portsmouth. I know I'm asking a question for a question. <laughs> um, Jennifer, if you want to turn your mic on and another Jennifer. Okay, she said, let's go with yes. Let's go with yes, okay. Uh, if that's the case, they're actually working in the military. Um, so that would be National Archives. Um, or Naval History and Heritage Command. Uh, World War II could have been a civilian, although unlikely to be actually in the shipyard during that time without some military clearance. You know what? Take down that library at Maritage Museum email and shoot us an email about that. And then I will have your contact information and I can put you in touch with their historian slash curator who would be able to give you the best bit of information. If I don't know the answer, I'm gonna try to find you somebody that does. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. For research assistance at the Mariners, do I need to make an appointment first? If you want to come into the museum, yes. If you want to just email us, nope. Um, and the only reason we're doing appointments right now is we're in a temporary location. We are in the museum proper, but we are in the process of planning for and building a massive center for the collection, which will rehouse all of our library, all of our archives, and all of our 32,000 objects. And that, when I say objects, that's anything from our teeny tiny buttons to our big boats that are not on display. Big project, big building. Um, but just, our new building, little. yeah, just a little, um, <laughs> will be a spot so that as a researcher, it doesn't matter if you want to see something in the library, the archives, the collection, or all of it together, one stop shopping for you. But right now, we do have to do it by appointment. Understood. 
Okay, Wilson uh, shared that in the 1730s, pinks were used in cross-Atlantic voyages to, be, to bring Palatinate immigrants to America, and he gave a link to um, the Wikipedia page for that. And that is all I have for questions in the chat box. If anybody else has any questions, you can still type them in or you can raise your hand and ask it on camera. And while they're deciding if they're going to ask questions, I'll just say thank you. That was fascinating. You learned all, kind, all kinds of fun stuff. What was the capacity of a pink? I'd have to go to the Wikipedia page. He links <laughs> <laughs> I'm the first one to admit, I don't know all of it, but I know where to go find it. The other <laughs> thing is, if you don't think of your question right now and you're sitting at home an hour tomorrow, and you go, you know, I wonder, shoot off that email. We are happy to respond. Um, our typical business hours are Monday through Friday, eight to five. But I will be honest, there's plenty of times that I like to answer on the weekends. So <laughs> don't be surprised. <laughs> All right. Um, I think you a pink was like, I could be upwards of 100 or something or, or more, 100. And fifty. I've I've tried to find the specs on them, and the most I could find was maybe it was kind of a converted merchant ship in those days. This is kind of first wave German immigration. I wonder if uh, is there a maritime museum in England that would yeah. have <laughs> more information on those? Um. When you say England, I'm assuming you mean Great Britain? Yeah. Yes, Greenwich um, or the Royal uh, National Museum. They're all connected. They are the Maritime Museum. They are like gods in the maritime world. We all envy them and wish we could be them. Okay. Do you work with them at all, interface on occasion with them? or mm, On a very slight occasion. Um, okay. I do send it to people to them quite a bit. Um, but as far as actually having a lot of interaction with them myself, no. And any information on Revolutionary War prison ships in your archives? Yes. In okay. the library side, more so than the archives. Um, is there a particular one or a particular interest? Well, just from what I've read about prison ships, it's pretty hard to, if you're, if your real ancestor was a private, unless he was a general or someone of importance, the, they didn't keep much records on who was who they took as a prisoner on those prison ships. That's uh, correct. Okay. Um, do me a favor though, and shoot an email to the Library at Mariners Museum with just a quick reminder of this subject. Um, I have a volunteer that works with me um, who actually works um, or volunteers at a location near us that uh, is actually setting up the library for Yorktown. So she's doing a lot of Revolutionary War information as well. She might have some other sources I'm not aware of. Okay, thank you. Of course. Yep. And, um most of the, the comments since then have been thank you and great presentation type comments. Um, you, we did get a question. You mentioned um, sharing the slides. Um, where can we find the slides? I will get it. I'll make a copy of what I have with a few edits and updates um, in my text portion. And we'll share those with you guys. And you can share them out. Not a problem. Excellent. Thank you so much. Happy to do it. Oh, do you have records of the crew from the slave ships? In some cases, yes. Interesting. All right. Well, that's all we have for the questions. Again, right. thank you so much. And this is a fascinating presentation. We've Happy got lots of compliments and, and hand claps. <laughs>
I'm happy as long as there are people that want the information, we are happy to share it. Now, I will have the link for my slides set for you probably from work tomorrow. Okay. So probably won't be until, let's just say noon tomorrow. <laughs> and the bibliography, I am giving myself a deadline of November 4th. So okay. we will have that to you guys ASAP. Fabulous. And we will, we, we, we will do what we can to help publicize that. So. Our job, my job is to make sure everybody gets what they need. And if we have access to it and can provide you a link to it, that's what we want to do. Okay. Actually, you did get one last yep. straggling question. Actually, there, there's one that wants private information. I will send you that via okay. email. And um, any tips for Eastern European grandparents before 1910? Uh, if you know what port they actually came out of, that would help. Um, a lot of times people from that area would go out of Bremen. Um, sometimes they would go all the way to Liverpool, um, but not often. So that's the first tip is to see if you can't figure out where they left from. All right. Um, Harold has his hand raised. Yes. Um, the gentleman who wanted uh, information about prisoners on uh, uh, ships during the Revolutionary War, um, I recall having seen on a number of occasions in the Virginia Genealogist edited by Barbara Vines Little, uh, such lists published. You mean, you. okay. And Roberta, there's a follow-up in the chat box. I am researching Eastern Europe. Also, Ellis Island and Castle Garden. Liverpool was a layover over here from Bremen or Hamburg. Thank you. <laughs> I truly believe genealogy and researching all of this is a family group effort. <laughs> <laughs> it can take a village. Yeah, I, I, I was I was making a face um, when Harold was talking about the Virginia genealogist and, and Mary uh, uh, made me feel better about the face I was making. The Virginia genealogist is not Barbara Vines Little. Do you did you mean the magazine of Virginia genealogy or did you mean the they're two different entities? Uh, I meant I, excuse me. I, I meant the magazine that okay. Barbara Vines Little uh, is it, primarily uh, consists of. Uh, transcriptions of various sorts of documents in Virginia. Anyhow, I, I definitely have seen their uh, list of prisoners on slave ships, uh, on uh, prisoner of war ships, a uh, revolutionary war, definitely. Okay. Could Thank you throw you. A, a, a link or her name in the chat or something, a reference for that? Uh, somebody, what was her name again? Barbara Vines Little. She is the editor. That's a publication put out by the Virginia Genealogical Society. So if you go to vgs.org, you can learn more about that. Thank you. Yep, yeah, that's as Mary just put that in the chat box as well. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> okay, a question on this, the uh, prisoner of warships. They were decommissioned uh, British uh, warships that were no longer in service. Not all of them. Well, the, most of them, of them uh, that I've seen or heard talk about that they, they decommissioned, basically, they sat there, and uh, that's what they were used for as prisoner, prisoner of warships. Yeah, but some of them were actually seized vessels that weren't seaworthy. So, yeah, they would sit out in the harbor. Yeah, which, which is decommissioned if they're not. In in service, and they just basically sit there as as a vessel. Technically, no, because they can't be decommissioned if they were never commissioned. <laughs> okay, you got me. <laughs> I know I'm splitting hairs with that, but 
the commissioning and decommissioning of vessels is really, really particular. So, Lloyd's of London. <laughs> yes. Jennifer? Yes. What would be the um, normal port of entry for 17th century immigrants coming in that settled in southeastern Virginia, especially Isle of Wight County? I would think Norfolk. Well, that's so what is Norfolk these days? Yeah. Okay. Um, if that research question came to me, I would be going to the port records that I have on microfilm that I mentioned that were the British listing um, because it is that time period for Virginia and start scanning because a lot of the vessels actually would come in and because of their size actually could go up river a bit as well. Okay. I've seen some weird things in the port records where there's actually been people docking, say, in Newport News. Oh, okay. Not something we think of, but the vessels were a lot smaller back then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric Grunset has added to the chat box, the most recent publication on prison ships is titled Forgotten Patriots, which is not the same book that he did on minorities in the revolution with the earlier and same title. All right, anything else before we wish everyone a good evening? All right, well, thanks again, Jennifer. This has been fascinating. We will look forward to, to your updates. Wonderful, thank you. I, like I said, I'll have those to you ASAP. Fantastic, thanks again. All right. Good night, everyone.